Now, there's one other element that I have been talking about for a long time that gives me great grief as a Catholic. I think that Donald Trump is president because of the issue of woman's right to choose. Mm -hmm. When he signed that paper saying, these are the judges that I will appoint, that was the dog whistle to the evangelicals, to the Catholics, and all the rest. A woman will not have the right to choose. And many of these people are um, very good people. That's just their point of view. But they are willing to sell the whole democracy down the river for that one issue. Mm, that was Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi sharing her thoughts on pro-life Catholics last month. My next guest addressed the speaker directly soon after her statement went viral. He wrote, quote, Nancy Pelosi does not speak for the Catholic Church. She speaks as a high-level, important government leader and as a private citizen. Joining me to discuss this, as well as the ongoing COVID restrictions on worship in California, is the Archbishop of San Francisco, Salvatore Cordelione. Archbishop, thank you for being here. Uh, you said Speaker Pelosi owes voters an apology. Have you heard from the Speaker's office at all? Uh, not uh, directly. I've... Uh initiated a contact with her office, and I got a reply from her office. Um, so, but it was not a response to my statement. Mm -hmm. Not all bishops, uh, Archbishop, have been quite as vocal as you have when it comes to responding to public dissenting Catholics. Was your correction a predicate, a warning for some other determined action here? I mean, should Pelosi and others present themselves for communion, for instance? There's a major challenge we face as Catholics with what the bishops now are calling uh, Eucharistic revival, that uh, mm -hmm. it goes hand in hand with the decline in belief in the real presence. Catholics don't understand anymore what it means to receive communion. They just understand communion, I think many Catholics do, from my observation, as you belong to the community. It's it's mm -hmm. not uh, the sense of worthiness to receive communion that goes back to the time of St. Paul and has been reiterated co consistently in terms of being baptized and, and right belief and living a life in a state of grace is completely lost. So we need a, a major effort for a recatechesis. If that were the case, then Catholics would understand that someone who uh, is, favors something uh, that is a serious evil, what we call formal cooperation. These are technical categories of moral theology, but the average Catholic until mm -hmm. not too long ago had a basic concept of it. If you're favoring something that is gravely evil, uh, that's that's seriously sinful and uh, objectively. Now, I know we're not going into the form of conscience, but in terms of the objective action and puts one in a situation where they really need to confess that sin and be absolved before presenting themselves for communion. Mm -hmm. um, last month, when um, Joe Biden was sworn in, uh, the bishops released a statement. Archbishop Gomez warned and worried, frankly, that some of Biden's policies, particularly regarding the family and abortion, were moral evils or could lead to moral evils. You were supportive of that statement. How important is it for bishops to stand up to politicians who profess their faith, use it for political advantage, but then promote policies counter to church teaching? We need to recognize these issues for what they are. There's a whole panoply of issues that uh, the church and we bishops are uh, supporting that affect human life and dignity. Uh, and they don't fall into one political category or another. They, they spread over the categories. But we do need to prioritize and I think there's two ways that looking at an issue such as abortion, which attacks human life at the very beginning and the most vulnerable. I think there are two ways of looking at this. One way is that it's a serious issue, but it's one among many other serious issues. Another way of looking at it is that it's, as the bishop said, it's preeminent. It's of paramount importance because it attacks human life at the very beginning, the most innocent. And if there's no right even to, to live, then how can there be a foundation for any other rights? And we, if we think about the horrendous evil that happens in an abortion, what actually happens in an abortion, which is as gruesome as could be imaginable, and it's a specific action. Uh, there are many things that attack human uh, dignity that we're vocal on, such as racism. But you know, racism is an attitude. 
and it can take on different manifestations in specific actions. Everything from telling a, a racially colored joke to lynchings. Now that's a pretty broad spectrum, but those are specific actions. I don't think anyone uh, today would think that it's acceptable to support a politician who thinks lynching people of a certain race or religion is fine, as long as that politician is good on the economy, good on the environment, and, and a whole host of other issues. It's like, it, it just colors everything else. So uh, yeah. some of us see abortion in this category, that it's it's it strikes at the very foundation of human rights, and it's very gruesome and a horrendous evil that can't be conditioned by anything else. Yeah. No, that's the horse trading people do before elections. Well, they're good on the environment and they're good on this issue, but, oh, they support abortion, but that's okay, because, look, the, the scale is heavier on this side. And you, you make a great point. Uh, Bishop Robert McElroy of San Diego, during a recent Georgetown University forum, said this about dissenting Catholic politicians. I do not see how depriving the president or other uh, political leaders of, of, of uh, the Eucharist based on their public policy stance can be interpreted in our society as anything other than a weaponization of the Eucharist and an effort not to convince people by argument and by dialogue and reason, but rather to pummel them into submission on the issue. Uh, and so I think it'd be very destructive. It would also cast the conference more significantly into the role of being partisan, as being associated with one party rather than the other. Archbishop, is denial of communion to a public figure a partisan act? Is it a weaponization of the Eucharist? McCarrick used to call it a conflict at the altar rail. Yes. Uh, well, it would depend on the context. Certainly, if it's a policy issue, no, that would not be, be a reason to warrant it. And certainly, we do seek dialogue. We try for dialogue. Uh, it doesn't always succeed. But at a certain point, if it's something so horrendously evil and there can be no progress in moving, and uh, the then Cardinal Ratzinger, head of the Congregation of the Rock and the Faith, did give this instruction many years ago to the U.S. bishops about the, the dialogue that has to take place with Catholics in public mm -hmm. life. And if they cannot be uh, their heart cannot be moved and converted, then uh, uh, such a decision has to be made. But it depends on, on this whole context. Again, I would go back to my example of racism. We could perhaps tolerate a politician who once in a while tells a racially colored joke, as distasteful as that is, if they're good on other things. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we tolerate one who condones lynching people of a certain race or, or a certain religion. Uh, that's like so far uh, off the spectrum so far so serious that we just can't see it as yep. one policy issue among others. Uh, so there eventually has to come a time when this is not tied to politics. It's, it's, not, um, it's not a sanction either. Uh, it's a declaration of someone that's not uh, in a state to receive uh, communion. It's not um, a, 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 an application of the church's penal law. Mm -hmm. No, well, I, it's been explained to me that it's a charitable act because you're concerned about the well-being of that person's soul. And this is, a, it, by denying them the, the sacrament, you're waking them up and saying, change your behavior so that you can get right with the church and God. And there's also the other thing, and very quickly, aren't the bishops charged with protecting the sacrament itself from scandal? Yes, certainly so. And this is another grave challenge we have. There's been so much neglect of that for, for decades now, really. And um, even by, I, well, this is based on my observation and personal logic, even by priests in the parishes in so many ways, not protecting the sacredness of, of the Eucharist. So this mm -hmm. casual attitude has entered into Catholic minds, and so they can't understand why anyone should be told not to receive communion. It's it's, they see it as a rejection of the person when it's, as you said, it's quite the contrary. It's an act of charity to try to move the person down the path of, of holiness and fullness of life in Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, Archbishop, I know you've been very uh, engaged in the question of 
access to the sacraments throughout this COVID crisis. I know you've now returned to doing some small inside, in, you know, masses inside your cathedral and in churches. What's the state of things now in California and what's your plan going forward? Currently in California, we have the colored tier system and uh, all of the counties in the state except four are in the most restrictive tier, the purple tier, which bans mm -hmm. indoor worship altogether. It only allows for live streaming a service with, up, with the people there necessary to conduct the service up to 12. Uh, so it's, it's the only state in the country that has an absolute ban on indoor worship. Other states have ridiculously low uh, numbers. Uh, so that is the current situation in California. There are two churches in Southern California that are, are challenging this, and we're waiting for a decision from the Supreme Court on a request for injunctive relief. Before I let you go, the Benedict XVI Institute, which you founded five years ago, encourages beautiful liturgy and a Catholic culture of the arts. The Institute has announced a year of the homeless with a requiem mass to be celebrated in November. You've also organized a series of fundraisers via Zoom to raise money for ministries working with the needy. The first one scheduled for February 8th. What prompted you to focus on the homeless this year? This started about two years ago when um, in the Archdiocese we decided in uh, November to have a memorial mass for people who died homeless. Uh, then we did it in the following year. And then it, with our Benedict XVI Institute, we have our composer in residence, Frank LaRocca, who composed the Mass of the Americas. So I decided for the second mass to commission would be uh, a Rocky Mass uh, for the homeless. And I asked him to, through sacred music, convey the sense of life on the streets of the chaos and the fear um, and the, the confusion using musical elements could use dissonance or syncopation, things like that. Um, and so in order to um, help heal and, and unite people through beauty. And so we then we came up with the idea to have a whole year of these special events that will raise funds to help uh, organizations that are assisting the homeless and using the arts. We've also uh, commissioned uh, San Francisco artist uh, Bernadette Karstensen to uh, do a painting of the patron saints of the homeless, who's on, whose feast days we'll be observing through these uh, special events throughout the year. So bringing together truth, beauty, and goodness in, in support of and addressing uh, the people who are homeless. Your Excellency, thank you. And you can find out more about the Year of the Homeless fundraisers and Mass and how you can participate at freethemass.com. Archbishop Cordelion, thank you again. Thank you.